Okay, so it looks like we're a few minutes into the chat. So let's start answering some questions. I'm going to pick one randomly. Um, so maybe let's take a look at the list. Uh, so one of the questions that I'm seeing here is um, this idea of, uh, so this is Gul Filiz Isik asking a question. Um, and Filiz is asking, I have a bachelor's degree from physics. I'd like to study quantum information science and quantum computing for my graduate degree. My question is, I don't know how any, I don't know any programming language and I'd like to learn Qiskit and I don't know where to start. So a couple of things to keep in mind, if you have a background in physics already, uh, for your graduate degree, one good way to get um, more informed degree. about what's my involved is, in this field is to see the kinds of problems that people are tackling today. So one nice place to start is by looking at the list of papers that are being published and looking at the focus areas. In particular, you can ask yourself the question of, do I want to study more about the devices themselves? Which means going into um, the experimental side of things. So going to graduate school to really start playing with the devices, making them sometimes. Another question is, do you want to be focusing on maybe building quantum simulators, maybe even using cloud quantum computing systems to simulate some interesting physics? Uh, so depending on which direction you want to go, the kind of material that you'd also be interested in changes. If you'd like to focus more on the devices, I actually think one of the best ways to learn is to start exploring um, papers from uh, the past decade, so uh, from 2000 to 2010, where the first quantum bits were being demonstrated in many different platforms. Those papers are very accessible. And in fact, even when I started graduate school, one of the first courses I did on quantum hardware focused on reading those papers and gaining intuition on the physics of the systems. If you're interested in trying to understand how to implement physics on the cloud quantum computing devices, the fastest way for you to start is by actually learning how to program on over the cloud. Um, this, this is one of the things that we're very excited about. And one of, the, one of the things that we have online is an open source textbook that helps you learn uh, not just what quantum computing is, but also how to program the cloud quantum computing system. Where Qiskit comes in, right? Qiskit is an open source language that helps you program these quantum computers. So that's the, those are two different directions that you can go. Um, and if you have any more questions, I'd be happy to go even deeper into it. Let's see. I hope that answered your question. Let me look for other questions as well. So Nick Oz is asking, will a classical computer always be used to communicate so with a the, quantum computer? Or will we ever um, be able to program quantum processors to work directly with the hardware? So one, one thing to keep in mind, that Nick, is that question, even today, the way we talk to the quantum computers is by translating programs that we want to run on these quantum computers, which are basically sequences of microwave pulses. Um, by translating them from a classical computer and applying the right signals onto the quantum devices. And at the end, once you're done computing with a quantum computer, almost always there is some additional uh, post-processing step that you need to do in order to interpret those results and see them in a way that's useful to the problem that you're solving. So classical computers and quantum computers will always work hand in hand. And this is something important to keep in mind. Uh, because just as much as we're improving the, qu the quantum computers, it's important to keep in mind that we need classical computers to communicate with them. Let's see. In order to interpret those results and see them in a way that's useful to the problem. Lots of really good questions. Uh, 
So the general idea of, uh, so Max Smith is asking the question of what math background do you need to study quantum computing and what books do you recommend? Uh, so right next to me, I actually brought um, the, the standard textbook of the field, uh, Mike and Ike. I don't know if you can see it very clearly here. Um, this is one of the books that's used while teaching quantum computing. Uh, one of the chapters that's in this really book, good question, uh, if I remember correctly, um, this is the, right, yeah. So this is the second chapter, Introduction to Quantum Mechanics, is a really nice coverage of the mathematics that you need to know from linear algebra in order to understand uh, how to implement quantum algorithms. So personally, for me, that's how I got started. Um, I had an engineering background, uh, but seeing the different aspects of what I've already learned and how they apply to this particular field was very useful. And so all of that because I read the second chapter of um, the standard textbook in the field. Once you know these things, uh, then it becomes very easy to take the math and use it to go through quantum algorithms and understand how they work, to really understand how to quantify, um, how to write up about measurement results, how to write states of many qubits and things like this that become very useful as you're talking about quantum algorithms. Uh, another thing that I found very useful to, um, to keep up with the math because really it's important to be learning the math, but it's also important to be experimenting with some things is to be programming as I went along. When I was learning, quantum computers were not available on the cloud. So what I would do is write down quantum states in, uh, in any other tool, um, Python's uh, numerical tools in particular. And from there, I would experiment on what I would see from quantum states. Uh, but today, you don't need to do that. You can actually work with the real quantum computer. So things have improved since then. So take full advantage of it. See. Learning quantum computers were not available on the cloud. Um, Python's uh, numerical tools in particular. And from there, I would experiment Maya on- Maya Wallach is asking, from... can Qiskit be used for chemistry and physics simulations? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so if you browse through the archive, so that's arxiv.org, um, you'll find a number of papers that are coming out pretty much on a daily basis doing either physics or chemistry simulations. Um, if you want to see specific details about how these algorithms are implemented, there are two things that you can do. One is to first look through um, some of the review papers in these fields. There's a very nice review paper um, for quantum chemistry, for example, that came out recently. Um, and maybe what we can do is link, uh, link to it in the Slack channel. Uh, where you can find this paper, then you can read through it. So uh, similar for physics papers, the, I mean, there are many different kinds of physics that you can simulate on these computers, but at the end of the day, lots of examples for you to follow online. There is a component of Qiskit called Aqua, which is what we use to do um, simulations at the application level. Um, chemistry and physics simulations can be done at that level. So if you want to get started uh, using Qiskit for these simulations, I would suggest looking into um, Qiskit Aqua. Uh, there's a lot of active development in Qiskit using, um, using these tools. Okay. Uh, Sing Shout Dance is asking, what might be a tough question, thanks for sharing. What's the coolest Qiskit use case or code pattern you've seen demonstrating quantum algorithms? Uh, we try our best to showcase some really cool usage of um, uh, Qiskit usage uh, in, in our IBM Q awards. You might have noticed we just, uh, we just announced winners of the IBM Q awards a um, few, few days ago. If you look at some of those award winners, uh, and I would like to call out, for example, the Circuit Optimization Challenge winners, and even the Teach Me Qiskit and Teach Me Quantum Award winners, all of these are using Qiskit in some creative way, whether it is to teach or to implement uh, quantum circuits efficiently on the, on the real devices. 
those are some really cool examples to look at. Uh, and I think you'd really appreciate some of the work that has gotten into those. How's everyone doing so far? So it looks like Narendra is uh, is asking, thanks for the great tutorial on Qiskit. It would be very helpful if you would add more content on VQE and QAOA. Thanks for bringing that up, Narendra. That's something that we're actively working on and uh, you'll soon be seeing some changes. Uh, I don't want to uh, speak too far ahead, but this is something that we're actively uh, working on right now. Uh, can I just ask for those of you who have seen some of our um, tutorials, what kinds of tutorials you think are missing? What would you like to see if you could tell us in the chat? Maybe one thing we can do is also use this as a learning opportunity to provide even better tutorials. Okay, let me look for questions on the Qiskit Slack channel as well. Give me one moment. So, Knowledge Magnet is asking the question of whether quantum computers are dangerous to encryption. Uh, so this is one of the questions that, that I've seen a number of times and the answer to it is, First of all, the, the way our internet uh, is secure today depends on encryption algorithms that answer, that depend on the fact that factoring numbers, very large numbers in particular, is a very hard problem to solve on our computers today. And that difficulty of solving that problem is why we're able to have um, uh, encrypted internet connections with uh, secure things like our bank accounts. But one of the algorithms, one of the crown jewels of our field is an algorithm called Shor's algorithm, which um, which shows how to do this uh, much faster on a quantum computer. But there's a, there's a catch here. Um, so one of the challenges that you'll find is that the overhead to do Shor's algorithm on our quantum computers today is quite expensive. And so as a result, the, the, the number of qubits that's required, and in fact, the number of good qubits that's required, uh, means that we're several years away from quantum computing being a danger to encryption. At the same time, um, one of the things that you'll find is that the, even though we're a few years away from this kind of thing happening, it's important to be careful uh, in terms of predicting that exact timeline. But it's also important to keep in mind that because this is something that will eventually happen, um, anyone who's interested in keeping their information secure over the time frame between now and then should really start be looking in looking into um, storing information in a safe way, perhaps in a quantum uh, resistant way. And there's a lot of research kind of going on in this field. At the it's moment. important to be careful. Uh, Okay, it looks like we're getting lots of questions. Frame between now and then should really start be looking in looking. Ankur Singh is asking the question of where can I get more information on the structure of a quantum computer? So Ankur, one of the important things to realize is that there are many different physical implementations of these quantum computers. Uh, many different flavors. So you could use an electron spin, for example. This is um, this is a physical system that I personally was working on in graduate school. Um, you could use superconducting qubits. These are the systems that IBM and others are using in the field. So really to understand this question of what do these physical systems look like, uh, you need to zoom in on what each of them, uh, what each of them does specifically in its own field. So while the physics is slightly different for the physical implementation of these systems, at the end of the day, I would suggest as you're looking through the literature to ask yourself the question of how are they making a qubit? What kinds of ways are they using to manipulate their qubits? And also, how do they get multiple qubits to interact with each other so that they can create entanglement? 
for example. So whenever you're looking through the literature, it's always a good idea to keep these questions in mind so that you clarify to yourself what physically is going on in these systems. Uh, in, um, in the superconducting systems, for example, we're using something that's very similar to a harmonic oscillator, uh, so an LC circuit with a slightly nonlinear component added to that circuit so that now you have uh, different energy levels that you can separate out um, with different energies and address. So that's how we create qubits, for example. But that specific thing that I just told you is how the superconducting qubits at IBM work. Uh, there are many other kinds of qubits that are interesting. Electron spin qubits, uh, for example, work by um, in the simplest case, taking an electron spin in some system, maybe a phosphorus donor in silicon, and applying a large magnetic field to it so that you get an energy difference between spin up and spin down states. Uh, and then you can address rotations between these two states. So as you see, even from just these two descriptions that I gave you about how electron spin qubits work versus how the transmon qubits that we use at IBM work, Understanding how these physical systems look requires really going deep into the question of what kinds of physical systems are they even using. So it's a really interesting thing to look into. And if you have any sort of physics background, I think you'd appreciate the sheer amount of engineering work that, that goes into defining these quantum systems. Sanjay is asking, what are the prerequisites for starting programming in Qiskit? This is a really great question. Uh, so one of the things that you need to do, first of all, is recognize that Qiskit is, um, is based on Python. So familiarity with Python helps. Um, we've put together in our Qiskit textbook, which you can find if you just Google Qiskit textbook or if you go to qiskit.org slash textbook, you'll find that uh, we've put together a prerequisites chapter, which covers Python and Jupyter notebooks, which are tools that you need to run um, to run things using Qiskit. One thing I'll point out is that you no longer need to install Qiskit on your computer to run things. Uh, you can go to quantum-computing.ibm.com where you'll find an online platform with uh, Qiskit notebooks where Qiskit is pre-installed for you. So you can write things online and you don't have to worry about, for example, running something and then your computer's battery dies or something like this. Things will continue working over the cloud. So I would suggest going to the, to the quantum computing website again. That's quantum-computing.ibm.com and uh, doing your work there. Ram Lakshman is asking, how long would a qubit last in a quantum system? Uh, so it depends on, again, uh, so a few minutes ago, we discussed the different kinds of qubits. It depends on what kind of qubit we're referring to. The, the qubits that IBM is using in particular are um, uh, they have coherence times, which is the number that you're asking about, of um, 100 microsecond, 200 microsecond, those kinds of numbers. But what's important to keep in mind is not so much the number itself, uh, but the question of how many operations can you fit within that time that you have. So it's not only important to have a very long coherence time, obviously that's always a good thing, but also being able to do your gate operations very quickly. So every time you see someone dragging and dropping gates, each of those gates takes some time. So it's a question of how much time do those things take relative to um, the coherence time that the qubit has. Uh, let's see, uh, let's see some questions on Slack. If you would like to post questions uh, in the Qiskit live channel, we're also monitoring um, monitoring questions there. So I'm going to pick a few questions from there as well. Um, Amodwani asks, uh, actually brings up the point that learning from papers is very hard. And I completely agree with you on this, especially as you're starting in the field, it can be quite tough to go through papers. My strategy for, for this has been to really look at the references. Um, if you've ever heard of this algorithm called depth first search in computer science, what it means is 
if you uh, basically in this scenario, if you see a paper and you're having a hard time reading it, but it lists some reference for what it's doing, go read that reference. And then as you're reading that reference, you'll find another interesting reference that you can then go read. And doing this, doing this sort of habitually, really trying to gain a deeper understanding of things helps. And that's how I got more acquainted with reading papers and also knowing how to read papers very quickly uh, by skimming through, looking for the key concepts and then going very deep on those key concepts. How's everyone doing? Lots of requests coming in for us to make videos on specific topics. Um, Juan Diego Castro Miyashiro is asking us, do you think we can have a video on the HHL algorithm? Um, I've seen a few other questions as well. Um, thanks for these comments. So they really help us define what kinds of material to work on next. Um, we're always listening to your comments. So thanks for asking these questions. Um, we'll work on these materials and uh, try to deliver them to you as quickly as possible. Uh, someone here is asking for my email address. I'm always happy to interact with you on Skit Slack uh, and help you with any projects that you're working on or at least find someone to help you with projects. So, please reach out to us there on Kiskit Slack. It's much faster than interacting over email because we can talk um, very quickly. SKG Rope is asking, what is the next big thing in the quantum industry? Uh, lots of big things in the quantum industry. I think it's important to realize that this field has come so far, but there's also a lot of room for new exciting ideas. Uh, improving the qubits themselves. So that's one, uh, that's one big thing that I think is on the horizon. Um, in addition to improving the qubits themselves, learning how to use them to do useful things in, in the real world and then implementing those useful things in a way that is improving our daily lives. Those are the, the other big things that are on the horizon. Um, improving the software, uh, really, really improving the software in such a way that we use the hardware as efficiently as possible. Uh, given the parameters of the One hardware that we have today that and, and the in horizon. the future, the kinds of hardware that we'll have, extracting the best performance from that hardware is something that always needs improvement. So those are some big things that I see coming in the horizon. And one thing I want to emphasize is that there is so much to do. Um, and so if you have any ideas, if you have any projects that you want to work on, push hard on those projects because there really is room for making big impact. Um, so I suggest that um, if you're inspired by any of these topics or even if you have any projects that you're working on your own, work hard on them, contact us, let us know some of your results, let's start working together. Devender Yadav is asking, are there any newsletters or blogs that you recommend to be updated on latest happenings in quantum computing? Uh, so habitually, one thing I've been doing is browsing through the archive, again, arxiv.org. Um, there are many different blogs that you can follow, uh, but they tend to be very specific to the kind of person that's writing them. So what I found is simply it's good habit to look through the archive to see at least what the latest happenings are. Uh, the quantum computing, um, quantum computing, uh, social, uh, social media environments tend to be very friendly as well. If you have, uh, if you follow some personalities on Twitter, for example, you'll find their latest results being posted and discussions about these results as well. Uh, so these, these kinds of things can keep you updated on not just the things that are happening in the field, but also things that people are excited about and are working for. Another really cool thing that happened, um, uh, that happened recently is that I'm seeing a lot of movement to 
make materials not just accessible, but also to have data from papers come online. And that allows you to not just see data and papers and learn about it, but also to be able to work with that data yourself. Uh, as a result of, um, unfortunately, the, the, the pandemic that's, uh, that we have right now, one of the things that's happening is that conferences are starting to become online uh, venues instead. And what this does is allow us to get video presentations of, um, of talks that would have been given at conferences in much broader audience setting. So for example, on YouTube. Uh, so this is another way to also take, a, take those kinds of things and use them as learning opportunities are starting to become uh, so Juan is asking what's your academic background how did you get to where you are now um, <laughs> this is a <laughs> this is a very very long story but I guess the short version of it is um, I did uh, electrical engineering and uh, computer science in my undergraduate studies. Um, I was very unclear about what to pursue in my graduate studies for some time. And my undergraduate advisor um, handed me a book. It was Feynman's Lectures on Computation. And that book basically showed me that you don't have to pick between you know, specifically going into an electrical engineering discipline or into a specific computer science discipline, there is a field like quantum information where you can have a very nice mix of engineering, computer science, and also physics. Uh, and then once you have sort of this broad understanding of how these fields work with each other, you can go very deep on um, one of those uh, for your graduate studies. So that's how I started in quantum information. And once I started, I, I learned that I liked experiments, uh, uh, exper doing experiments on these systems, making the devices themselves. So that's what I spent a lot of time doing in graduate school. Um, so at the same time, I had the opportunity to teach quantum algorithms courses. So I think that was an opportunity that gave me, um, that gave me good grounding, both in terms of making the devices as well as learning the quantum algorithms and being able to teach the quantum algorithms. And uh, eventually, so one of the things I wanted to do is, um, so I'm originally from uh, Ethiopia. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do is make sure that quantum computing is not something that's limited to very few places that even a country like my own can have access to a quantum computer. And really the the, the cloud quantum computing effort, so having quantum computers on the cloud since 2016, really changed that for a lot of people. And one of the reasons why I chose to work at IBM is specifically to do this, to be able to not just have access to cloud quantum computers, but to be able to get everyone in the world to use these quantum computers. So I, I, in a nutshell, that's how I got to where I am today. I hope that was helpful to you, even though it's a very personal story. Uh, Paras Ragmi is asking, um, I'm a graduate student in physics. I said, hello world on Kiskit yesterday, which congratulations. Um, I just want to know the career opportunity for being expert in Kiskit. One of the, one of the things that you'll find is that uh, while you're learning Kiskit, you'll probably find some projects that are very interesting for you to work on. And the expertise you develop working on those kinds of projects is what gives you the opportunities for your career going forward. So for example, if you like, you mentioned that you're, um, you're studying physics. If you like simulating something about uh, physical systems, maybe it's simulating open quantum systems, for example, that's something that's fairly challenging to do. And I think you'll find that there are very few resources. So, you not only have an opportunity to learn on your own, but also to teach others. Uh, and on, on a related note, someone also just asked, um, uh, let me make sure I find the name. 
Vilaymai Ramanathan is asking, is it possible to simulate open quantum systems using Qiskit? So not only is it possible to simulate open quantum systems using Qiskit, uh, there actually is a textbook for learning how to use this now. Um, we'll link to it in the Slack channel, but if you just look up uh, Turku, University of Turku, um, uh, open quantum systems textbook, you'll find that there's a very nice document that shows you not just how to learn about open quantum systems, but also how to use Qiskit to simulate these systems. Uh, I'll also put it in the Slack channel so that you have an easily accessible link. Uh, one of the things that I'm super excited about is the ability to use not just the circuit model that we have now, but also to be able to use uh, microwave pulses to interact with um, our quantum devices in such a way that you can simulate an open quantum system. So Vilayma, if this sounds exciting to you, maybe um, let's discuss over the Slack channel and we can come up with some projects um, that we can work on. Tanmoy is asking, is there any certification program that IBM is going to launch or is there anything existing which we can do? So one of the things that we do, Tanmoy, is um, a program called uh, Qiskit Advocates. So the Qiskit Advocates is a badging system where we make sure that anyone who has made contributions to the open source uh, project um, is, uh, is, is uh, rewarded. So we have a test also that we have, which, uh, which you need to pass and also you need to make open source contributions in order to become a Qiskit advocate. That sounds like something along the lines of what you're asking about and we're always looking for uh, more ways to get people more excited and the certification program is definitely something that we're also looking for. Satvik is asking, in the future, will there be any workshops in India, Hyderabad? Uh, so Satvik, we have now um, an engaged effort making sure that we, uh, we have workshops um, in India. We've seen a lot of interest there. Um, and so thank you for your question. There will definitely be a workshop in your area very soon. Uh, so please go to the Qiskit Slack channel, Satvik and uh, just remind us again where you're located so that we can try and arrange a workshop for you. We have, um, our community team is uh, really, really good at organizing these events. And we also have a lot of interest coming from that area. So we'd be very happy to help you host a workshop. Okay, uh, more questions coming in. Uh, Meghnath Kanal is asking, difference between state vector, chasm, and unitary simulator. I am new, I don't know the difference. Uh, that's okay, Meghnath, so let's go through each of them. Uh, so as you're simulating a quantum system, you can ask a few questions, um, at least in the circuit model. So the, one of the questions that you can ask is, I just ran this quantum circuit, what are the results after I do a measurement on the qubits, uh, some set of qubits? Uh, looking at those measurements is the, and getting extracting the counts that you get from each shot of those measurements is what you would do using the chasm simulator. Uh, you might know that uh, quantum computers uh, use gates and these gates are unitary operations. So the unitary simulator is a way for you to look at a circuit and to ask, what is the effective unitary operator? What is the matrix corresponding to the operation of this quantum circuit? Uh, you also asked uh, about the state vector simulator. Um, so we mentioned the idea of measuring the results of the, of the running the quantum circuits. Another question you could ask is not so much what the measurement outcomes were, but um, what the state vector, the quantum state looks like at the end of the quantum circuit. So to get that information, uh, what you do is use the state vector simulator in Qiskit Air. I hope that clarifies all of these. Let's see.
Knowledge Magnet is asking again, can you make a video on Shor's algorithm? Okay, that's uh, that's another useful thing for us to um, work towards. Thanks for asking us about it, Knowledge Magnet. Let me look in the Qiskit Slack channel. Give me one moment. So out of curiosity, can I just ask uh, people here if they've taken a look at our Coding with Qiskit uh, video series? Um, so I'm seeing some questions about it and I'd like to see how people, um, how people looked at that video series, if that was helpful to you and what, you, what more you'd like to see in that video series. series. Um, so I'm seeing some questions about it. Curious if that was helpful to you and what you'd, what more you'd like to see in that video series. Okay, uh, there's a slight lag between uh, uh, the conversation here and the comments coming in, but I can see that people are responding to the question of having seen um, having seen the video tutorials. Um, I think people are starting to make the point that there were some more videos that they would like, but that otherwise it was very useful. Um, we have someone here, for example, so uh, the, the message is, I'd like to see machine learning coming with Qiskit. This is something that, um, this is something that we've also heard repeatedly, so something that we're actively working toward. Uh, so we're also seeing um, we're also seeing interest in the difference between Aqua, Terra, and Air. So these are the components of Qiskit, and we would be happy to clarify those in future videos. Uh, Abdullah Amr is saying, "I personally found the Qiskit textbook online to be more helpful than the video series." Um, Abdullah, thanks for saying that. We we do recognize that um, the the way people learn can be very different. Sometimes reading books is uh, is a much better resource than watching videos, and other times it's the opposite. Um, so that's why we've put together all of these resources. I'm really glad that uh, you found the one that works best for you. I'm personally also like you. I prefer um, reading and working through mathematics instead of watching videos, uh, but. Uh, a large number of people, and sometimes even myself, in, in some cases when I'm learning new programming languages, um, people like to watch videos. So I hope having a combination of these two covers a lot of ground for people. Vishvaraj is asking, uh, coding with Qiskit uh, videos are great. Can you make a tutorial on how to use Qiskit to simulate chemistry or physics problems? That's, that's a very interesting question. So something that we will keep in mind as we're designing our next set of tutorials and videos. Um, thanks for that, Vishvaraj. Ben Rahid Sahar is asking, how can we contribute to hardware development? Uh, the fastest way to do it is to, um, to go to graduate school, learn how to make the quantum devices, uh, or to, get, to gain an internship uh, where you would get an opportunity to make the devices and to contribute to the development of the hardware. Now, when you say, uh, when you say hardware development, uh, I should point out we have, we have a very nice internship program. Um, that allows you to have mentors at IBM who help you um, understand how to make these devices. And as a result of that internship, you'd have an opportunity to contribute to the development of the hardware. Uh, additionally, one thing I'd like to point out is that when you say hardware development, it really depends if you're talking about developing the quantum hardware, so the chips themselves, or the hardware that's driving the quantum computers, so all the electronics that supports usage of the quantum computers then the way you contribute to that um, can be different. Uh, it's, uh, it depends on which one you're interested in in order to be able to answer that question specifically. But fastest way is to either do a, an internship uh, in industry or possibly if you're an undergraduate to join a research lab and uh, work throughout the semester to get the opportunity to make these devices. Uh, 
Uh, Sattvik is asking, can we be interns in the hardware field? Uh, absolutely. We have, we have a very nice internship program. I would suggest going to the Slack channel and um, messaging me or any of the IBMers there. Uh, we'd be happy to show you how you can apply to the internship program. Uh, this time of the year, it's a bit difficult because the internship program is uh, mostly winding down, but we'll see what we can do. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Prasita Raja is asking, I need to learn quantum computing from scratch. Where do I get it? Please suggest some resources. It's, uh, we've, we've already discussed some of these items, but I think the fastest way for you to get started is to get a good understanding of the mathematics involved. And for that, we talked about the second chapter of um, the standard textbook in the field. So I'll bring it up again here so that you can see. Uh, and also to follow, um, to follow videos on how to program these quantum computers. That way, at least you'd have a very good intuition on what it takes to manipulate quantum systems and also to be able to manipulate them using quantum circuits uh, on your own by writing these uh, programs. Knowledge Magnet is saying uh, we're having trouble with uh, Slack. Uh, maybe, Paul, we can put the link to the Slack channel here or um, somehow guide people over to our Slack channel. Yeah, hey everybody. Um, in the description, I've dropped the link to the Slack channel. Let me know if that doesn't work though. Thank you, Paul. Okay, uh, let's look for more questions. Uh, Javier Verbal is asking, is there a different approach to work with IBM Armonk? So IBM Armonk is uh, our first open uh, quantum system which allows full pulse level access. So you would run quantum circuits on that device as you have been using um, Qiskit but you now have the added benefit of using a module of Qiskit called Qiskit Pulse to be able to not just write quantum circuits based on gates, but to fully define the shapes of the microwave pulses that are going to the device, the frequency of the microwave pulses and so on. So the, the way, the simplified way to think about it is you have the ability to interact with IBM QR Monk uh, as you have been other devices. You also have more control on that quantum system. Daniel S. is asking, is it possible to get involved at IBM Quantum Computing in Germany? Um, physics bachelor graduated. Uh, so Daniel, please reach out to us on Slack. We would be very happy to help you um, get more involved in Germany. Uh, we have a lot of effort there already. You might have heard about the Fraunhofer announcement. Um, we have a lot of team members working on this as well. So uh, if you go on Slack and reach out to us, we'd be happy to connect you and uh, help you get started with um, being more involved in the community. How many people here have, uh, out of curiosity, how many people here have attended a quantum computing hackathon? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so what I'm seeing here is that uh, quite a few people uh, have attended these hackathons. I'm also looking in the Slack channel for any questions. Hey, 
Hey, Abe, while you're looking for questions there, I think I'm just going to jump in and talk every once in a while. Um, mm -hmm. You can keep looking. If people need some help with Slack, I'll keep an eye on the, on the uh, uh, chat and, and answer questions. But also remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We've got a lot coming here. Um, and we can, we can kind of help people get questions answered uh, since we're probably not going to get to everybody. Thank you for asking so many questions. Ben Rahad Sahar is saying, I participated in Africa camp in December 2019. Uh, I'm really glad that uh, we had you there, um, Ben, and it really is exciting to see the engagement coming from the community on these hackathons. Uh, for me personally, also, that hackathon was very special because that's my home continent, and it's exciting for me to see quantum computing really going all over the world and getting excitement everywhere. Hi, Olivia Lanes. Meghnath Kanal is asking, for a beginner undergrad student like me, it's hard to follow Slack as there is a discussion of fast topics. Is there any way we can get a mentor? So this is a really good question, Magnat. So one thing uh, I'll say here is um, there are Slack groups where um, people are going through reading sessions. So for example, you'll find a Kiskit textbook reading group. Uh, it might help to be in more focused uh, Slack channels like that. Additionally, it also helps if you see someone who is responding to questions actively to reach out personally and ask if you can work closely with them on a specific project. And always, you can also reach out to someone specific. I'm always happy to mentor someone, um, and I'm sure the rest of the IBM team is also happy to mentor. So, Magnath, please reach out. Feel free to reach out, and um, we can work on um, we can work on specific projects or topics of interest to you. Okay. Uh, are there any plans or workshop or uh, of a hackathon or workshop in India from Tamil Das? Uh, I can give you a very clear answer, and that's a resounding yes. Um, I strongly suggest that you reach out to us on Slack uh, because you might be able to help us organize some of these hackathons. Um, in addition to just attending them. And I think uh, you'll be very excited to see what we have in store. So please reach out to us over Slack, Tama. Hey, but I'm just gonna jump in real quick. I think we're gonna go for about 10 more minutes. So we got time for a few more questions. Thanks everybody. Let's look for questions on the Slack channel. So one of the questions that we're getting here is from Juan Diego Castro, who's asking, where can we have information about the hackathons? Uh, so uh, Juan Diego, please take a look at uh, kiskit.org, where we post updates about all our community activities. Uh, in addition, um, I would suggest also monitoring the Slack channel because we also post updates there. Shahar Zamir is asking, if I want to learn IBM Q, where should I start? Um, Shahar, we have a lot of great resources for you. A great place to start looking is the education landing page, where we have everything laid out for you to take a look. Um, if you go to kiskit.org slash education, you'll find a number of great resources. Uh, one of these resources is a textbook that you can read through. 
uh, and learn how to program quantum computers. The other is a set of videos, for example. And there are a number of other things that you can do to stay more involved in the community. Lots of questions coming in in the Slack channel, actually. Uh, let's take a look. Yes, so uh, we brought this question up before also, the, the question of how to keep updated with the field. I think one of the most useful ways, again, to keep up with the field is to go um, go to um, the quantum computing um, the the quantum computing archive page arxiv.org and browse through the list of recent papers. I think it's very useful to keep in mind also that you can see a lot of engagement about these papers on social media. So I suggest also following quantum computing uh, accounts on Twitter. Uh, and personally, I also would suggest following qiskit.org because we highlight recent results, um, recent papers that are using Qiskit. Uh, and it would be very useful for someone who's learning about the field, someone who's getting started, to see these examples to learn how things are being implemented uh, in the latest research. Vira Brahmendra is saying live coding question mark. I presume from that excitement that you're asking for uh, live programming sessions. Uh, also something that uh, we're working on currently. So if you are interested in something like that, maybe why don't you um, send me a message over Slack and tell me or you can even post it here about what kind of thing you'd like to see. And maybe one thing I'd like to clarify before we leave here is uh, there's a lot of opportunity to engage with the quantum computing community here. There's a lot of opportunity to build a community within uh, your area as well. So if you're excited to see the hackathons, if you're excited to see workshops, any such thing, please reach out to us and we would always be happy to help you organize something and to help you in any way that we can to make sure that you can rally a community around you. Yeah, that's a good place to end, I think, Abe, and a um, good time to just let people know what we've got planned um, coming up. Every Wednesday at this same time, we'll be doing more live streams with other people, live coding, interviews. So if you you know, want to be, stay involved and, and propose questions or topics, um, I think we've made it pretty clear, but let's let's chat over in Slack. I think that'll be the like place that will stay together because um, I'm not quite sure what happens to this chat uh, once the live stream's done. Abe, any last words? It's a great time to be alive, to have access to quantum computers as you're learning about quantum computing. Um, I think it's a wonderful time for everyone to be learning and contributing to this field. Uh, so I really support anyone who wants to learn. And if you feel like you need someone to reach out to, always feel free to reach out. We can work together on projects. Uh, we have an active community team here who's excited to help you organize events in your area as well. So always feel free to reach out to us. At the same time, we have a number of things coming. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that, so right now, for example, you're looking at me, but behind the scenes is Paul uh, doing a lot of work along with Clinton. Um, I think it's important for us to thank all of the all of the team members. 
So maybe if everyone can just thank Paul and Clinton for making this happen, um, this, is, uh, this is a great effort and it's exciting for me to see the engagement for the community, but also to have our team working together with you. So thank you to everyone. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks for watching. And um, if I could just ask one more time, hit that sub button, that would help us. Uh, we're, we're working on a lot of videos um, and, and we wanna teach you and, and get you what you need. So thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week. Abe, thanks for being our guinea pig. No problem. All right. Bye.